It looks like we've got everybody here. Um, at least from our staff, staff needs, I believe we're all here, which is great. Thank you, staff, for being available this afternoon. And um, I will go ahead and call the meeting to order. Good afternoon. Welcome to our 5 p.m. May 18th, 20 special meeting of the City Council. I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on Community Television Channel 25 and streaming on the City's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All Council members are participating in this meeting remotely. I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's City Council meetings. If you wish to comment on today's agenda item, call in at the beginning of the item using on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it is time for public comment, sign on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak during public comment, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you have commented on your item of interest. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Watkins? Here. Kalantari Johnson? Here. Brown? Here. Cummings? Here. Golder? Here. Vice Mayor Bruner? Present. And Mayor Myers. Present. We do have one item, and Bonnie, I will have to ask you to, if you could possibly, I did not bring this down with me. Uh, can I reverse order and do the proclamation at the end of the, um, at the end of the meeting, Bonnie? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah and I'll, I can email it to you. So you have yeah, to. please email that to me. Thank you. Did not make it in my briefcase. Um, okay, we will go ahead and um, our general business item um, first tonight, and this will be item number two on our agenda. And this is a uh, item on Santa Cruz County's Housing for a Healthy Santa Cruz, a fr strategic framework for addressing homelessness in Santa Cruz County. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the, staff, of the item by our staff, followed by uh, additional presentation by our uh, county colleagues, and uh, then we will have questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council. Uh, so I will go ahead and turn this over to Lee Butler, our Director of Planning and Community Development on, 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 and Homeless Response. And tonight's um, discussion uh, and uh, action tonight would be to accept and file the final version of the Housing for a Healthy Santa Cruz, a strategic framework for addressing homelessness in Santa Cruz. And so I'll turn this over to Lee, and I just also want to welcome Randy Morris and Robert Ratner from the County of Santa Cruz and um, they will be doing the main, main part of the uh, presentation tonight. And I just want to thank the council for being available tonight to um, hear about this important framework uh, that is uh, important for everyone in our community countywide, but also uh, important for our planning efforts and our work that, uh, regarding homelessness in the city. So Leo, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Myers, and good evening, council members. I have the pleasure of introducing this evening Randy Morris at the county. He is the Director of Human Services, and Robert Ratner, who is the Housing for Health Director at the county. And we've been working with the county very closely for quite some time um, as they have developed this um, their three-year and three-year strategic plan and six-month action plan. They'll talk to you about how um, their six-month uh, plans will be rotating um, as uh, they move through the three-year strategic plan process. And I just want to uh, extend thanks to the to Robert and Randy, to the both of them, 
for the coordination that they've had on a regular basis. Um, I think Randy's been with the county for a little bit for a year, and um, Robert uh, started about the same time that I started in my role. And um, we have uh, had many, many meetings together, um, whether it's with the, the two by two committees or the homeless action partnership, um, our, our uh, communities continuum of care, or just on a regular basis, we are um, trading emails and jumping on the phone and getting Okay, well, so good, Randy. Okay, thank you. Well, um, back at you, Lee, for the partnership. It's been great working with you since you were assigned this lovely task by your city <laughs> to address this uh, vexing issue that um, it really is a humanitarian crisis. And I want to start with that. The human element of this is very serious. Um, and in communities like Santa Cruz and many others where cost of living is high and this issue is pronounced, it, it really challenges the best of us staff, myself included, and elected officials in city and county to navigate this. This is an issue that's profound, it's large, it's big. Um, you know, and sometimes what we have control over is how we work together and not some of the bigger issues. And I just hope we can kind of lean into that. And I hope what you hear tonight helps give a frame uh, for you to see how we're trying to, to maximize working together, because that's very challenging. Um, Lee, that's impressive tracking. Um, I want to be um, humble that I um, the human services director here uh, for 15 months. I started uh, one month um, BP before pandemic. And so my tenure here has been in the pandemic, and I'm getting used to um, these video meetings, which is unfortunate. I wish we could be in person. Um, I'm going to just say a few introductory remarks. I'm really going to turn it over to Dr. Robert Ratner, who was hired, and as you also tracked, um, Lee um, started in November. And I do want to make sure your and your constituents listening and your other staff on the phone. Um, we did really do a community hire, and um, your city manager, Martine Bernal, was actually on the hiring panel that selected Robert. It was very important that we had city and community um, and county representatives. Um, I want to just share a little bit about human services. Questions come up, why county human services? If you do not know this, um, there is absolutely no mandate from the federal or state government about what the county is supposed to do around homelessness, nor any directive about what county operation is supposed to manage homelessness, and that is one issue that confounds cities trying to figure out who do I talk to at the county, and us counties don't even know when we look to the state and said who's supposed to run this thing. So this county, like um, many counties in um, avoided stepping up and taking on responsibility to really lean into this issue until our current CAO, Carlos Palacios, was appointed. Um, this community before Carlos is not the only community where the county shied away from stepping into this rabbit hole because once you get involved, you are engaged for the long run. So I want to recognize and I appreciate um, Martine Bernal, your manager, city manager, who's given me a lot of history of what it's been like before Carlos when there was the county not being very responsive. And even since, Carlos, we have a lot of work to do, but we're still trying to making up for a lot of years of not being a partner to you all. And Robert and I recognize that, we've inherited that. Um, by just a touch of introduction, county human service has three main operating divisions, and the fourth, which was added to our plate by the decision of our Board of Supervisors and our county administrator, Carlos, is what you'll hear from today, and that's Robert, the director of our Housing for Health Division. But the other three are the foster care division, um, the Employment and Benefits Divisions programs like Workforce Development Board, um, Medi-Cal, Cal, CalWorks, um, CalFresh Food Stamps, um, and also in Aging and Disability programs like IHSS and APA. I want you to just know that those are the programs I run that in partnership with um, the health office that runs mental health services and environmental health services, together we sort of create the safety net in county, and that's the reason why our CAO wanted this office to be not in the CAO's office, an administrative hub, but really embedded in where the services get provided at the county level. And that's why um, the office was transferred to us uh, in November. So now to get ready to up, Robert, I want to remind uh, your council, I would be very impressed if you remembered this with the volume of duties you face. <laughs> that back November 10th, and I had to go look at my calendar myself, uh, I was in front of your council on Zoom with my colleague, uh, the assist, uh, assistant county administrator, Elisa Benson, on November 10th. We were in 
front of you to share what was a draft of what today is a final plan. The very short version of a very long story is when Carlos uh, was appointed CAO, created his uh, strategic plan, said we need to lean into addressing the issue of homelessness is getting worse, and a national consulting firm uh, called Focus Strategies was hired, and it was really under my colleague Elisa Benson's leadership in partnerships with cities and counties to lead to that draft plan that was presented to your council on November 10th. We shared with your council then that we would be back in front of you at a date future, which is now today, that we would work with your city manager's office. Um, as Lee mentioned in his introduction, we're very closely with uh, Mayor Myers and Vice Mayor Bruner and uh, coming, so we worked with you prior <laughs> to the transition of you from mayor, um, to work on that draft to make sure that what we put in front of you is really representative of city's interests. I do want to take a minute to share with your council, all of you, and the public watching um, what is not being asked of you tonight. That's almost more important because <laughs> every time the topic of homelessness comes in front of a legislative body, it brings lots of people concerned about what decisions might get made. It is not a question tonight of any city budget priorities, purposing any city budget money anywhere, any policy priorities, picking or choosing one priority over another, or any siting issues. None of that is part of what we're talking about today. Rather, this is what is often referred to as a collective impact model. Let's get all the stakeholders who are interested in a vexing, complicated issue like this to have one common way to look at the issue, to think about the issue, to talk about the issue, so that we maximize collaboration, minimize confusion and finger pointing. Um, so hopefully that makes sense, that um, I think it's called a and file, Mayor Myers. So hopefully this is a softball, which is normally not what you have in front of you when the issue of homelessness is in front of you. It's really just asking us to use this framework. And, and Robert and I are happy to be back in front of your council when there are decision points that do involve budget and policy where there's partnership between county and city. Um, I want to end my comments before turning it over to Robert to share um, what in my sort of, towards the end of my career, I've been in the field of health and human services for 30, I can't believe it. Um, I'm finding there are fewer and fewer mentors and I'm one of the more seasoned ones, so I guess I have to lean into that role. Um, I have seen moments like this in my career um, in health and human services where there's a tremendous amount of human suffering human beings that were responsible to are not getting served well, and there's a lot of finger pointing and frustration and not enough resources to do what we want to do. In county government, and I believe this is the case for city government, when you're dealing with an issue that's this historic, this complex, that really is a byproduct of decades of public policy at the federal and state level and some local, we are in a moment where the city and county to death not solve this. What we are in a moment is where the federal government and the state government are starting to recognize, and if you haven't read the governor's May revise that came out, there is more and more recognition that the federal government, state and government want to invest money in this because this issue is a national crisis and is particularly pronounced in California and is particularly pronounced where cost of living is high, like in places like Santa Cruz. So I have seen this over and over in my career and I just going to share, take it or leave it. <laughs> When the federal government, state government starts thinking about investing in solutions to issues like homelessness, they often choose to pilot money. They don't just give the bank out there. They wanna see and strategically invest and see where things are working. And too many times I have seen that the federal government and state government is hesitant to invest pilot money where collaboration is bad. So I think we have all in our myopic seat spent a lot of time putting energy into trying to figure out why the other party isn't doing their job or has the money that we don't have. And you know what? We can go there. <laughs> but what I would really invite us to all think about is does that position us well or poorly for future potential investment opportunities? And both county and city have spent time writing editorials, writing talking points about why the other is the problem. I, we could, we could go there, <laughs> but I think we should invest more time and energy in talking about where we have common ground, which is none of us have the resources, none of us have the solutions, and let's work to position ourselves for this new 12 plus billion dollars that the state's putting out 
and a presidential administration and a federal Senate that might want to invest more. I think we have the beginnings of a good plan. The last many months have been very positive on the heels of a lot of challenges, and I hope we can keep that trajectory going. And I'm going to end by to see not on video, but I'm going to call out your police and fire chief. There is also a growing recognition that cities are bearing a profound burden in California because there is a lack of services. We can spend time, not tonight, unless you have questions about why we are not funded appropriately to deliver those services, but we share the challenge, financial and policy crisis. So let's work on it together. Let's go after funding together. And I hope what Robert's going to present now will provide a framework that's agreeable to you all. And um, I will stay on board here. And Robert and I are happy to answer any questions of your council. And we'll follow your lead, Mayor Myers, on how you do public comment if we're supposed to respond or not. I know different cities do it differently. But hope well, you can kind of catch the, the vibe of what we're trying to get. I hear that word here a lot. So I'm trying to catch that vibe. And I'll turn it over to uh, Robert. Thank you so much, Randy. Great, great opening uh, comments for us all to, to, to think about tonight. Um, Robert, welcome. Thank you all for having me. I'm really looking forward to getting to work with all of you on the issue of uh, making sure everyone has a home, which is a fundamental part of our framework, working together to uh, build a coalition, as Randy alluded to, to make sure everyone has a home that's safe and healthy to live in. I'm going to pull up some slides that will give you all an overview of the framework that um, is on your agenda item today to accept and file. And then we want to make sure we have time for questions and discussion with council members and the public. So pull up slides for everybody. All right. Um, can you all see that okay? Yeah, it's in, um, it's in uh, presentation format. Um, Robert, if you want to flip, switch it. There we go. All right. Uh, oh, so hang on one second. Still there in presentation mode. All right, let me uh, try to share it differently. Okay. That better? That's better. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. Uh, so uh, the framework is to cover our work together over a three-year period, uh, January 2021 through uh, January 2024. And we refer to the framework as Housing for Healthy Santa Cruz uh, intentionally because our perspective in doing this work is that we need to bring people to the communities safe and healthy for everyone, and housing is really an integral part of that. Uh, Randy and I both work in the County Human Services Department, and Randy spoke to the role of human services in our community, but we also work closely with other county department, departments, particularly the health department, um, and profits and interested stakeholders. Lee alluded to the fact that in our community we have something called the Continuum of Care, which is a federally mandated um, entity that is supposed to bring people together to address homelessness. And in Santa Cruz, that entity has been called the Homeless Action Partnership. So our new division is helping to provide staff support to the Homeless Action Partnership. And we'll be doing that in an ongoing way. So this is an outline of what I was going to cover in the um, presentation today. Uh, Randy alluded to the fact that we presented to uh, I wasn't here, but uh, Elisa Benson and Randy presented an initial draft of the framework to the city council in November, and we collected feedback and made some changes to the original document, given the framework, talk about how some of the stories uh, that we used to describe the issue of housing and homelessness may impact our ability to make progress, and then share some initial analyses around funding gaps. If we were to make the investments that this framework calls for, where are we in terms of resources to, to get to the goals, and then highlight some of the elements of what we're trying to do in this first six-month period, which is from January through June 30th. And uh, as Lee alluded to, the framework calls for us to develop collaborative six-month plans um, over the three-year period, so we're in that first six-month period right now. 
So some of the changes we made based on the feedback we received were uh, the original document was very text heavy and didn't have a lot of graphics. So please make it easier to read and understand. We, we made some effort and we shortened it and used a lot more graphics. There was uh, strong feedback that we needed to spend more time talking about the major contributor to homelessness being the gaps between the cost of housing in our community and the incomes that people have. Um, and then how we work together to close that gap is going to be really critical to addressing homelessness. There was another point that the community members raised is that it's a lot easier to prevent someone from losing their home than to try to help someone get back into housing. So we need to figure out how do we shift our efforts and energy to preventing people from losing their homes as part of the overall framework. The original draft in many people's minds didn't speak enough to healthcare issues and how they can contribute. Many people in the community called out mental health and substance use. Sometimes behavioral health is the other term that's used, issues and how they can contribute to difficulties in people getting and keeping housing. So we added some more information about that in the framework and highlight it's really important that we include improvements in how we connect housing with behavioral health services as part of our overall collective impact effort. Um, there was a request that we talk about how we're going to address encampments and problems that come up when people are unhoused and are trying to live in an unsheltered situation. And that's been added into our framework and we certainly have work to do with um, our city partners and others on, on that issue. And then uh, another recommendation that really came out is include the voice of people who've lived through or are experiencing homelessness and being part of like, taking their, their perspective into account as we try to address this issue together with them. The framework calls for some numerical goals. So this slide shows uh, the Santa Cruz County point in time count of the number of households experiencing homelessness and then the goal to get to by 2024. Uh, we heard feedback that some people in the community felt like our, our goals were not ambitious enough and some felt like they were not um, realistic. So I think we're in the, in the middle space between being uh, too ambitious and not ambitious enough. But we're aiming for a decrease in the number of unsheltered people um, and households experiencing homelessness, cutting that in half time period, and then cutting by one-fourth the number of um, households and people experiencing homelessness overall in the community. And the framework asks us to think about how do we do this work together around some guiding principles, and they're highlighted here on the slide. Um, one that uh, I, I continue to forget to change, but it says date-driven. It's also uh, time-bound and data-driven, so using information to make good decisions and specific time frames for us to complete activities and, and documenting those in a transparent way. Countywide in scope, really thinking about this issue across the whole community and making sure we address the differences that are present geographically and with different subgroups, but really thinking countywide system making sure that we're coming up with actionable steps and things we can do to, to make progress, focusing on the people who are really impacted by living without homes and incorporating them into the work. So having a person-centered approach, looking at equity and inclusion as we think about how do we approach this issue. If, if you look at the data on who's more likely to experience homelessness, it's groups that are often overly stigmatized um, and who often are impacted by long-term historical, systemic uh, forms of discrimination and isolation. So we really need to account for that in our work. And then the systems approach alludes to the fact that we can't just invest in one area without investing or thinking about how investing in that area links with other parts of the overall effort. So for example, if we just invest in outreach, but there's nowhere for outreach providers to connect people to, we haven't really used approach. We haven't been very strategic. So we have to really think about investing in ways that help people prevent loss of their homes or if they're currently without a home, how do we help them go from an outreach connection to a permanent home? So along that path, we need to make sure we're, we're investing in all those different strategies and interventions, which the um, material in the has recommendations from the framework around some targets for us. These targets are based on some analyses that focus strategies, this outside consulting group that came to do some work in Santa Cruz. They looked at our data from something called the County Homeless Management Information System 
And if we could move in the directions they recommend, they think we can get to those targets that they alluded to earlier of reducing the number of people experiencing homelessness by a quarter. So it calls for us to increase the number of our temporary housing beds um, from 440, and this was before the pandemic. We've significantly increased our temporary housing, which includes shelter and transitional housing as a result of the pandemic. But when the pandemic funds are not available anymore, we're gonna go back to, or maybe even we'll see if we don't invest more in temporary housing, we'll see a reduction from that 440. But it calls for us to have a goal of 600 temporary housing beds. Rapid rehousing is a particular strategy that combines services with some funding to help people move into housing and pay rent for a defined period of time. Not ongoing, but it helps people transition back into a home and increase their income to be able to hold on to that housing. And then permit supportive housing is deeply affordable housing, typically seniors and people with disabilities, coupled with some services to help them move into those housing opportunities, but also to support them to maintain that housing over the long run. So in addition to building out that capacity, the framework calls for us to reduce the length of time people are in the different programs above and increase the number of people that were actually able to help program into permanent housing. So if we can accomplish all of those things, we can get to our goals. Uh, this, I do wanna say this model that uh, Focus Strategies came up with is one potential model for getting to those goals. I think the core thing that they're trying to get us to do through the recommendations is monitor our progress over time, looking at data, seeing if, if we make investments in one area, are we getting the kinds of outcomes that we want? And if not, making adjustments so we can get to the ultimate goal of helping as many people as possible get back into their own homes. Some of the key areas for action in the framework are, uh, and Randy alluded to this as um, collective impact. I think of it as building a coalition or developing our community capacity to respond together to this issue. So that's one of our, our key tasks in our new division and partnership with the, the city of Santa Cruz and others. Preventing homeless, uh, increasing connections between people who are unhoused and those who are able to provide support and connections to resources to get, can get people back on a path to permanent housing and thriving again in their lives. And then expanding our permanent housing capacity overall. Uh, the, the framework calls for us to get to some of the root causes of, and we call out four in particular. One is the housing affordability gap that I alluded to, the gap between the incomes of people in our community and the cost of housing, that's bold, face on the slide because it's a, a number one issue that was called out in our community information gathering process. We really need to lean in and, and deal with that issue. But not other things on here, um, health issues and how they impact people's ability to access and keep housing, making sure that people have supportive connections. There's a term that's often used called self-sufficiency and I think as human beings, none of us are fully self-sufficient. So we all need some level of supportive connections to stay safe and in home and to thrive. So how do we help create positive supportive connections for people that may have lost them? And then uh, another contributor to homelessness, I think is a sense of loss of hope and purpose, both at the kind of collective level as a society and us as leaders, elected officials. If we don't believe we can make a difference, if we don't have a sense of where we're going and a sense of purpose, we're certainly not gonna get there. And that can manifest in the experiences of people who are unhoused. If they, if they don't have hope um, and a sense that there's meaning and purpose in their lives, then it's much more difficult to get them back on a path to permanent housing. So we all need to work on the, holding on to hope and a sense of purpose as we tackle this issue together. I wanted to share a few slides just to give a, a more in-depth perspective on the housing affordability gap. And this slide comes from a report by the California Housing Partnership Coalition. It's a statewide group that occasionally does report cards on housing affordability gaps at different communities, in different communities. So what this slide shows to me is that in Santa Cruz County, uh, and this is data from 2019, there were 10,000 low-income renter households that were spending more than 30% of their income on housing costs. And there's a national standard promulgated by HUG that when you have to spend more than 30% of your income on housing, you're more at risk of having challenges related to your housing. Um, uh, there's a, a higher level if you're spending more than 
of your income toward housing that's considered severely housing cost or rent burdened. And that's the group that's the most likely to lose their homes from a, an event that puts stress, stress on the family or the household. Um, and that's the group where we want to close that housing affordability gap the most. So if we, want, if we were able to uh, pull out a magic wand and create as much affordable housing as we needed, we would need 10,150 new affordable housing units in the county as a whole. And you'll see later that our, our housing goals are much more modest than that. But that, that's the dream. Uh, the group of folks who are much more likely to experience homelessness are households that are categorized extremely low income. Often that's seniors, people with disabilities, students, um, people working minimum wage jobs, that's the group that's most at risk of losing their housing in the high cost market like Cruz. And that's the group that you can see is the most likely to be severely cost burdened. So if we're going to really get to the root causes of homelessness, we got to figure out how to close that cost burden. Uh, there's uh, stories that we, we tell each other in the press and in our presentations and in our private conversations and, and the stories often impact how we think about and how we do this work. And there were a few, a few stories that I've heard in my six months working in the county that I think are worth us reflecting on and maybe changing the narrative or the way we think about it. Uh, one story that I've heard here and in other communities, we've, we've got such a long-term housing problem. Robert, you just said we need 10,000 new affordable housing units. There's no way we can get there. We need to do shelter now and we'll get to that later. And I, I think we do need to get people into safe shelter as much as possible, but we need to do that with the end goal in mind. So when we invest in shelter, it has to be a smart investment in shelter that's um, resourced adequately to help people get to permanent housing. So we've got to have the investment in shelter along with to get people into permanent housing. If we invest in shelter alone, we will still have many people experiencing homelessness. So for, for example, in the city of New York where there's a right to shelter, they still have one of the highest populations of people experiencing homelessness in the country. So shelter alone isn't going to resolve homelessness. It's the shelter plus the services and permanent housing resources. Uh, they, they come here for the services. I've um, been involved with trying to address the issue of homelessness in, gosh, six different counties in the state of California, and I haven't been in a county where I haven't heard the um, the perception that people come to this community for the services. Uh, and I, I think it can't be true that every county has people coming to them for the services. Um, the data statewide and in Santa Cruz shows that about three quarters of people who experience homelessness lost in the community where they're coming to access services. Um, the state also recently put a web, uh, put on their website something called the Homeless this data information system. So it's a statewide repository of data from every county continuum of care or city continuum of care related to addressing homelessness. And they've pulled all that data together. And what it generally shows is that in four to 10% of people who actually come in for services and touch an agency that puts data in their system have also been in another community. So I think the data tells us that the vast majority of people experiencing homelessness are losing their housing where they're coming to ask for support. Um, there are certainly anecdotes and stories of people who've been in another community who've come here, but I think we have to step back and look at the big picture data to, to fully understand um, the impact. And if we're going to try to prevent people from losing their housing, we have to have a better understanding of who are the people in Santa Cruz County who've lost their housing, who've become homeless, and what could we have done to prevent them from losing that housing. Um, and then. I think another common perception is that because encampments are so visible and they can be very large, that's been the case in the Santa Cruz, there's a perception that that's the full story of uh, and the breadth of people experiencing homelessness. And it's um, untrue in most communities around the state that the people who are living unhoused in encampments are typically a small fraction of the people experiencing homelessness. Um, most communities, it's a quarter or less of people who are living in encampments that are actually in the overall homeless population, people in recreational vehicles, people not living in encampments, people living in abandoned buildings, their own cars. So I think we need to remember that the, the numbers of people experiencing homelessness and the, the diverse range of subpopulations is not represented just by the people living in encampments. 
This is one more slide. Uh, it's really dense and we'll make it available, but uh, one uh, it ties back to housing goals and how the state of California and we at the local level try to track our housing production goals. Uh, Lee, as someone who's worked in housing and planning, is very familiar with what's called the housing element and regional housing needs allocation. So these are goals established in eight-year cycles of how much housing production do we need at the local level for certain income groups. And I intentionally highlighted the far column. The far left column is for households who are living in that very low income group and how many housing units we're aiming to develop and make available in this community over an eight-year period. So remember, if we had the, the pure goal, if we were going to help all the households who were paying more than 30 income toward housing, we would have 10,000 new affordable housing units. So this eight-year goal is much more conservative of 734 units. And this shows that we're, we're close to the end of that eight-year period. And for the group that we need the most housing development for, we've got 76 of 734 units lying in Santa Cruz County. And you can see how the different jurisdictions in our community are doing relative to the housing goals. Uh, we've done a much better job in some of our jurisdictions in creating above moderate income housing, but we've done a very poor job in creating the kinds of housing that really is going to make a dent in preventing and ending homelessness. So this is something that the first for us to really track and lean in on how do we get more housing for extremely low income and very low income members of our community. I mentioned earlier that we did a preliminary financial analysis looking at how much money is coming into the community as a whole, not necessarily just to our division, but to the county overall, and how much is available, different types of interventions related to housing and homelessness. So this doesn't represent all of the places where we spend uh, resources to try to address homelessness, but some of the major areas are outreach to connect people, temporary housing, shelter and transitional housing, the rapid rehousing, permit supportive housing, and affordable housing. And the blue shows the estimated uh, on an annual basis if we were to hit the targets that are listed on the bottom of the graph. And the orange shows how much we have available uh, currently and how much of that, that money, the available money, is one-time funding. So the overall picture here is that if we were to hit the framework goals, we would need $65 million a year and 31 million currently. And of that 31 million, 10 million is one-time funding. So I think it goes back to what Randy alluded to. We have to make some really difficult decisions with limited resources around how do we invest it given the scale of the need and the cost to really hit these targets is much higher than what we have in terms of resource availability. Um, the federal government and the state government are ramping up resources, um, and I think we but we will have some decisions to make around how do we prioritize among these different needs. Uh, I do want to say that on this graph it shows the two places where we have the biggest financial gaps are affordable housing and shelter and transitional housing. And um, so as we're thinking about future investment, those are the, the biggest financial holes uh, based on this initial analysis of what we have in the community. And then Lee alluded to uh, what's in this first six-month plan and wanted to share some of the highlights. One is uh, Randy and I and our whole effort being more transparent about where money's going and what kind of results we're getting. We're really focusing in on helping our guests at our COVID-19 shelters to get into permanent housing and not have to return to homelessness. So we're investing a lot of one-time federal resources to keep our COVID shelters going as long as we can, but also to help people get into permanent housing before we need to close those down. Uh, focusing on supporting our current temporary housing programs to get better outcomes, so increasing the dollars and resources we give to those programs so they can have more positive results for the work that they're doing. I wanted to mention that we're in the process of changing the Homeless Action Partnership Coalition governance structure uh, Lee and other uh, the city have been involved with those conversations. So we will be coming back to the city council um, with some recommendations around how do we change the structure and how we, we govern this work together. 
Um, we've been working with staff in the city on some encampment response protocols, trying to clarify city and county roles and responsibilities. And I think we're making good progress there. There's some additional funding available at the state. Um, $12 billion is proposed, and there's a particular category of money called Project Home Key to help us acquire properties and to make them available quickly as either temporary or permanent housing for people experiencing homelessness. So there's some real opportunities for us in Santa Cruz to identify some sites um, before the next funding round becomes available. Uh, there's a term called getting to zero, and there's national organization called Community Solutions that has promoted a, a data-informed coalition building model for getting the number of people in certain subpopulations experiencing homelessness down to zero. So Santa Cruz County has been a part of that effort, uh, particularly around veterans. And um, we also are really committed to working to make sure there are no families experiencing homelessness. So included that in his proposed budget. So there are the work groups where people who are working with those subpopulations get together and try to unite our, and integrate our efforts to look at the data and make it, uh, make it um, possible for us to get to a place where no one experiences homelessness for more than 30 days. And then having more data available. So there's the state database. Our team helps shift some of our data up to the state so people can look at some of that data. But we also want to make it available locally for people to see what's happening with our investments, uh, what's the demographics of homelessness today, how are things changing over time. So we're working on that as well. And we will uh, re-engage with the city and other partners to develop our priorities for the next six month plan. And that is the end of the presentation. Now I wanna open it up for questions from the council and defer to you all on how to incorporate public comment. Great. Thanks, uh, Randy and Robert. Um, really great presentation and um, obviously a lot of work to do. And just want to really recognize, I think, Randy, some of your comments and Robert, yours too, that this is a humanitarian crisis. It's, it's bigger than any city or county can fix. Um, Robert, some of the numbers you've shown are pretty, pretty sobering. Um, and that, you know, many of these folks are, are, are they are our neighbors and our kids and our brothers and our sisters and our moms and dads and other people, you know, they're, they're, they're from our community. And I think that's really important for people to understand. And that um, for years, we just have not invested in the care piece of it. And we also haven't invested in the infrastructure piece, you know, to distribute this ability for people to have homes across our community. So we're catching up on decades of both of those issues. And we're unfortunately living that experience and the folks who are sure experience living that experience as well. Um, so I'll go ahead and open up to uh, questions or comments from council. And then um, for those of you who um, are uh, here tonight from the public, we will be having public comment on this. And I did receive one request for uh, extra time and we'll grant, definitely won't be granting that during, uh, during the public comment time. So for now, I'll open up to council and again, uh, the the uh, motion for tonight is is to accept this report. Uh, we're not taking uh, you know action on any kind of funding or as uh, you know was outlined earlier. Uh, this is really a acceptance um, of the report and um, uh, a chance for council to really check in uh, regarding regarding the uh, report contents and and uh, tonight. So I see, let me get my list up here. Sorry, iPad, which is a little different. Okay, uh, Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Robert and Randy for that presentation. Um, you know, I think a lot of those data points really highlight some, you know, important things we need to take into consideration around like what, what, what's gonna be needed in order to address this. And, you know, I think the mayor, you know, highlighted, you know, the fact that a lot of these people are from our community. And so, you know, while many people may think that people are coming from different parts of the country for the services, a lot of the people accessing these services are people who became homeless in our community, have been in our community. Um, one thing that came up the last meeting, um, but during COVID, for example, the, the, um, the county was able to 
put up a, a website where people could go and find information about how to connect homeless people to resources. I was just wondering if you all are going to be, if there's a website now up um, for, you know, all this work with more information how people can access services and what services are available, um, or if that's kind of in the works. Yeah, yes. thank you for that question. I, um, I would say there are websites, but it's still in the works. It's not to the degree that I, I would like it to be at. Um, so the Homeless Action Partnership has a, a link to how to get help, and the County Human Services Department also has that same link. Um, one of the, the big things I think we're going to focus on next six-month plan is what I call the kind of front door to services or how we bring services to people and how we make the community aware of what's available. So I appreciate you raising it. I think we can do better. Um, there's, there's a lot of free guides and things out there that we're not keeping up to date. So that, that's something that I think we really need to work on. Um, we have information up there now. I think we can learn from the, the COVID approach that was taken um, to build out something that's going to last. Uh, I want to, I'd like to piggyback by choosing to take uh, your question, Council Member Cummings Roberts' answer, to circle back to what we're focused on in the first six months, and that's transparency. This is a super confusing issue, and it's hard to understand where the money's going. Was one of the things Robert and I um, want to accomplish is being very honest with elected officials at, and the community about where we're putting our money. And I just wanted to use the moment to say it's complicated to figure out whether to take new money, invest in administrative infrastructure that's needed to run the backbone of these systems, because then that's money not going to direct services. And I think Robert and I are much more interested in decision points to elected bodies and to the community in full transparency so we can together make those decisions. But I just kind of want to take the moment to say Robert and I have had a career where we've been in well-resourced infrastructures and poorly resourced infrastructures. And it's never popular to say, please pay for more government people. But when you don't have enough people, you just sometimes can't get the systems in place to have the data, to have during a phone. So our interest is just bring back to people when we have money, when we're making those choices so people understand why. And then people can hold us accountable months ahead to say, okay, we approved, like our board approved the hiring of two analysts. We haven't hired them yet, but we're going to then deliver to the board when we're back in front of the board. When we hire these analysts, this is what they're doing that we couldn't do before. So I just want to use that moment to say we have many decision points, and one is better resourcing ourselves to deliver on, on this complex program, not just everything Robert listed. I hope that's helpful, but that's something we're grappling with, but I wanted to highlight the process we're hoping to go through to be very honest about the process. No, that's really helpful. Thank you. And then um, just kind of a side question. Um, will we have access to slides from tonight? Is there any way we can have those sent to us? After I just said transparency, I better an we better answer that yes. I think <laughs> Lee has it, or if he doesn't, would we be right to send it to Lee? Is that right? Oh, well, I'll send it to Lee and to Bonnie. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, make sure Bonnie gets it, and that way we'll we'll get distributed. Okay. Uh, next, I have Councilmember Golder. Thank you guys so much for um, bringing this presentation for us, and thanks for acknowledging too that it, it it will take a partnership and that it's more than the city and the county can deal with. Because I know it's you know not just a state but a national issue. Um, I have a couple. The first one is, uh, you said the goal is 600 beds, Robert, and we're, at, and we're, we're currently at 440 pre-COVID. What were we at during COVID? Because I know you set up some you know, temporary spots with the one-time funding. Uh, thank you for that um, question, Council Member. Uh, at a, if everything was perfect, we could have had 1,000 beds, but we never got to perfect. And of the thousand, some of those beds were set aside specifically for people who were exposed to COVID or came into contact. So they weren't necessarily for people experiencing homelessness. So the, the maximum we had that were available for folks experiencing homelessness was essentially double. I think we were around 880 beds. You can imagine that that's 
a huge reduction um, that's going to happen when the COVID funding comes to an end. And that's why this first six months we're really focused on what we've been calling the rehousing wave to help as many of those guests as possible get on a path to permanent housing. Um, and overall, I think at the end of the pandemic, we will see that the, the overall effort, um, which we're hoping to get reimbursed by FEMA for, is in the neighborhood of $40 to $40 in shelter and food. So there's this amazing emergency response um, that's allowed us to get people indoors, but it's one-time emergency only. So if we could sustain that level of investment over the long haul, we'd really see the, the results that we need to uh, get to. Okay, so uh, another question, um, and something else that I totally, you know, resonates with me is that it's way easier to prevent somebody um, from losing their home than to get them back into housing, obviously. And just knowing that, like, middle-income people like myself typically pay, like, 50% of our combined salary, family income, or whatever towards our housing, um, even if people have become unhoused living in our county is there any our county and other counties because it's really difficult to get back on your feet knowing how expensive it is it is here so like um you know other counties where the cost of living maybe isn't so high where somebody would have an opportunity to rent something that's a little you know uh, less expensive is there any collaboration between counties at the state level yes yeah an another another great question so um I was working in the San Francisco Bay Area, and there's a nonprofit called All Home California that's trying to create that county um, to county regional collaboration. And uh, because I, I'm aware of the leaders, they're, they're really interested in incorporating Santa Cruz into that. We're, we're in between two bays. We have some of the Silicon Valley related stuff happening in Santa Cruz, but we're also in the moderate. So, Yes, there are efforts to try to get coordination across counties, and the data system that the state pulled together is so that at the state level we can start to look at trends between counties. Um, I think your question also gets to when, when you're having a conversation with somebody one-on-one -on -one about, um, and I can relate to this personally as well, about where do you want to live and where are you willing to live. There are difficult choices you have to make based on the income that you have at the moment, the availability of housing, the cost of that housing. So I think part of our work to uh, help people experiencing homelessness is to have that conversation with them and be realistic about the current housing market and the trade-offs. Because often if you if you grew up in Santa families here, your roots are here, your services are here, things that matter to you are here, but there isn't a place that you can afford, mm -hmm. that's the kind of conversation that our frontline staff are having to have with people. Um, and folks make, we all make our own choices about what makes the most sense for us at a given time. But absolutely, that's got to be part of the conversation, um, trying to help people weigh those trade-offs. And, you know, mm -hmm. can you go, can you, can we help you in either through applying for the limited affordable housing or employment or living with others? Or are there places where you could relocate to be with family or friends or find something more affordable? That's mm -hmm. all really need to be, it all needs to be on the table. And um, I hope that across the state, we can do a better job of hitting arena housing goals, because frankly, this issue, and if the state also has a website where they're tracking those housing element goals statewide, and it doesn't look good that as a state, we're not doing a good job of hitting our targets. And the group that we're doing the poorest in developing housing for is the group that's the most likely to be homeless. So statewide, we. Uh, I mean, even though some of our neighboring counties might have some more affordable housing stock, it's still quite limited. So it, it's something we really got to push forward on across the state. And I don't want to hog the conversation, but I have one final kind of question-y comedy thing is that I didn't hear you. I did hear you say, like, um, you know, a little bit about, you know, we're talking about, sorry, love project by prevention, but um, I was wondering, um, I know some other council members and I are really particularly interested in investment in youth, and um, also some of us are really inter interested in prevention of substance abuse um, before it becomes an issue, and and also you know destigmatizing mental health. Um, and so, just it's more of a thing that's something I think that's, that that council members and I value. 
Yeah, I appreciate that comment, and we, we could talk a lot about it. I would say that um, what you're bringing up for me with that is that prevention comes in many forms. One, one way to think about prevention is, oh, someone can't pay their rent, so let's help them pay their rent. But actually prevention, if you think about it more broadly, um, how do we reduce stigma um, so that young people are willing to go and get mental health services before they're in a situation where they, they can't afford the rent? Um, how do we do more uh, education uh, around um, the needs of young people who are students um, and how to support them? So all those things can be considered a kind of broader lens on prevention. And I think we have a lot of work to do there, but also just on being more targeted with our very limited prevention dollars for people who, you know, they, they can't afford the rent. How do we help them address that and help them get the income they need to, to keep the place? So I'm with you on trying to figure out how to go upstream. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Mayor Myers, you're muted if you call the next colleague. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, next is uh, Council Member Contrary Johnson. Thank you. Um, yes, I would also like to thank um, both of you for this presentation tonight and um, everyone that you work with at the county, at the city, for the tremendous amount of effort it takes to uh, just get to where we are right now to have a comprehensive plan that. Uh, the Board of Supervisors has uh, agreed to that cities are getting behind. So thank you for all the work. Uh, I have some questions. I'll try to keep them concise so that other council members and the public have some time as well. Uh, you, know, you mentioned funding that will be coming our way, and we've heard some pretty big dollar amounts. Uh, I wonder if you could share your thoughts around how should we how should we be thinking? What steps should we be taking to make sure that we are um, ready to receive these funds and we are competitive to receive these funds? Robert, can I do a big political queue up and then you do the details? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's stop finger pointing. Let's stop writing editorials about the other party's the problem. Let's stop creating talking points that the other party's not doing their job. So that's been the history. And I, and I really mean that because that's public information. And I, I worry that the state's going to look at that history and say, yeah, let's wait till they get their act together a little bit. On the positive, uh, I think we are well positioned to have this framework. It, it, to your point, thank you for the acknowledgement. I want to give credit to um, Elisa Benson, my colleague, who did the heavy lifting and passed this baton nine tenths done to me and Robert. So there's a lot of work for us. I think this creates a framework that shows we have a plan. Um, and then a process comment, I'll turn it over to Robert to details. The May revise unveiled a profound investment in the safety net in California, profound. So it's going to be an unusual <laughs> process between now and July 1st. So the process is, you know, I think Lee mentioned in his introduction, we are on speed dial as staff to staff. Robert and Lee get most of the credit for their collaboration. We have the two-by-two two form represented by your mayor and vice mayor, and that's um, Sonia and Donna now. We will be talking a lot to answer your question in detail as this plays out. But I'll turn it over to Robert because there are some very, very key investments. What I think is maybe one of the most vexing and one where probably we need, um, if it's unincorporated, the board, if it's a city jurisdiction, a city council, and that is if some of this money allows us to purchase a site in a city jurisdiction, you all as elected know very well, Lee as the planning director know very well, the challenge that's involved in taking on a location. So that might be something we need to really urgently talk about if we have an opportunity that if we don't figure it out and work through the siting issues, we might lose the window and we leave money on the table. So stay tuned, a lot of dialogue between now and July 1st budget passing. And I, and I, you know, and I do want to like not over talk my comments about what not to do, but there's so, there is too much of that, and I just think that's so short sighted. It, it, it's not that it's not correct. There's been a lot of blame to go around, but it's just short sighted the focus there. So I really am talking as leaders, elected officials, lead staff. Let, let's really focus on work looking forward, so that we're we're well positioned. And I, th I think we're getting close. So Robert, you can share more details because there I, I have a piece of paper in front of me. There is a detailed list of all the investments the governor's outlining and all of them are strategies we need to position ourselves for for future funding. Yeah, um, 
Uh, just building on a few of the things that Randy mentioned, uh, I'd say number one, if you look at the governor's proposal, a large amount of the $12 billion is for securing property um, for uh, permanent housing and temporary housing. And that um, to identify locations together and to apply together to make ourselves more competitive. I anticipate that the state will roll out the funds by region um, and not have it entirely competitive. Um, but historically, the formulas that the state um, state officials use to decide how to divvy up the funds aren't always tied to the number of people experiencing homelessness or rates of homelessness. So the, the bigger cities, the bigger counties with bigger voices often get more of the resources. So I think there's actually an opportunity in the budget trailer legislation to really look at the formulas uh, and raise our voices up and say, you know, shouldn't these investments be tied to the, the need, um, not just who has the biggest uh, megaphone um, at the state level. So that's one thing that I think we can do. The second I alluded to is identifying projects um, physical plants and then figuring out how do we really support them. Um, and we have, as one of our recommendations, a housing and capital project pipeline where we keep track of potential projects that we can work on together to support financially. Uh, there is specifically called out governor's uh, proposal money to help with addressing encampments. So I think to the extent that we can keep doing the work we're doing about cl clarifying roles and responsibilities and how do we work together, we'll be, um, presenting our best face to state officials. Um, and we can say, this is what the city does, this is what the county does, here's how we work together. Um, and we'll be able to apply for those funds in ways that we wouldn't have been able to in the past. So that's another opportunity. And the governor specifically called out a desire to end family homelessness. So given the grant that our local nonprofit Housing Matters received from the Amazon Affiliated Foundation and our commitment at the board level to really address homelessness among families. I think there's a real opportunity for us to be successful there, building on um, those existing dollars and collaboration. Um, and then I, I think that as we look at healthcare reform, I think this is not on the radar. I'm a healthcare person by trade, and the Medi-Cal system in the state is also simultaneously undergoing a major overhaul and a lot of the resources to serve people who are living on low incomes um, from a health standpoint are going to be shifting over to our managed care partner, the California Self um, Alliance for Health, Central California Alliance for Health. Figuring out how do we take our housing and homelessness funding in partnership with managed care to provide the supports that people need around mental health and physical health issues, um, I think it's going to be really important for us to be competitive. Great. So it sounds like we're doing a lot of the things that we should be doing to queue up, and we have some more work to do. Um, I have uh, – great. I love the thumbs up. <laughs> um, uh, you know, you mentioned encampments and the um, governor's commitment to addressing encampments, and I, and I see there's a specific objective in this framework around working with city jurisdictions to address encampments. Um, I'm just wondering if you could comment on how you see, and I know you've been working closely with Lee and company, um, how you see the and city, how you see the county aligning with what the city's trying to do with say sleeping sites and transitional shelters and managed encampments. Um, how can we work together to make sure these are successful and that they're entered into the, the, the individuals are entered into the community, continuum of care? Yeah, good question. I, I think one of the things that's helpful from the kind of health and human services county perspective is the more consistency and clarity there is around city expectations of people who are unhoused and what's, what's okay and not okay to do creates opportunities for us as outreach providers and service providers to interface in ways that we haven't been able to do that before. So if there are specific areas identified where the sleep, we can plan for that. We can figure out, how, okay, can we bring a, a mobile homeless person's health project clinic service there? Can we bring some of our outreach workers there to connect them into services? Um, we also can get a better understanding of the people who are living in um, these encampments if we're coordinating more and what their needs are and how to more effectively meet those needs. 
So I think clarity and consistency around the kind of city's approach can really help us on the county side. Mm -hmm. um, and also for us, I think being clear about um, roles and responsibilities, you know, what does the city take on? What does the county take on? How do we refer um, people back and forth and how do we coordinate and have regular conversations? We're starting to do that work more than I think we have in the past. Uh, and I think those are all things that are gonna be really helpful. I know they're really difficult decisions and there's lots of community um, perspectives related to the issue of how do we help unhoused people and also make the community safe for housed and unhoused people. So I, I don't envy the task that you all have, but I think that the sooner you can reach some collective decisions on you know, what the rules of the road are, it's easier for us in health and human services to say, okay, now we really know how to partner with the city. This is what they're doing. This is how we can fit our resources in to those plans. That's great. Um, I'd, I'd like to jump in and say something in recognition for Lee and your police and fire chief that I might get to surface on video, but if you don't, I'm still just gonna speak about um, appreciating your challenge. I've been in this field of work homelessness with any other vexing issue, often these conversations that lead to whose role and responsibility is what. When you're in the hypothetical, the conversation's easier, but if you are somebody who oversees, like your police chief, your fire chief, but when the rubber hits the road, if I sign off on this document that says I'm responsible for this, I don't got the money. So I just really wanna highlight neither county health and human services, nor anything under your city's oversight, unless I've missed something, Lee or your police and fire chief are hiding something. None of us have the resources. But to your question, I started six months before Robert and it was a mess trying to have a conversation about roles and responsibilities. I think today, and thank you to your staff um, and to elected who helped us get to a place we are 90% there, but I just wanna underline that does not mean if the city says, yes, we signed a document, we're responsible, that we think you have the resources because we don't either. But back to your question, I think it positions us much better to go after funding to say, we have a framework, we know who's responsible for what, but both of us, county and city, need a lot more money to deliver on those roles and responsibilities. So I just wanna say that to recognize, and I think the um, mayors have been pushing very hard in California to demand money to reimburse for the costs that are being borne by cities, and there's not a lot of recognition of that. So please hear as county partners, we recognize you don't have the resources, even if you ultimately sign off in a roles and responsibilities document, but it positions us to go for the money together. I hope that's helpful, but I think it's worth naming to recognize the hard work of your city staff and our colleagues. Very helpful, and I appreciate you calling that out and recognizing, um, and, I, and I'll just make one quick um, and won't take up more time. Um, but I want to acknowledge Councilmember Golder's comment about um, upstream and prevention and working with the um, youth population. Um, and just a shout out to um, the Youth Homeless Demonstration Program that is now being overseen um, by your department and the great work that they have done in a short amount of time on addressing transition age youth homelessness. So I just wanted to call that out because um, we didn't have a concerted effort prior to three or four years ago and, and a lot of work has gone into that. So there's, there are some efforts happening in the county. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member. I will go ahead and uh, next is Council Member Watkins and then followed by Council Member Brown. Um, I, I too will offer my appreciation for your time this evening and for the important overview. Um, I think you really did hit on truly what we're up against, which is just this really um, massive hu human, humane, issue with varying different populations impacted. And you mentioned that we've had success uh, specifically thinking about our veteran population. And I just wanna speak to that because I feel that we really need to be aware that varying populations have varying needs and not everybody is the same and people are complicated and the issue is complicated so we need to approach it in that way, whether it be uh, women escaping domestic violence or whatever the situation might be for the individual experiencing homelessness, I think needs to be addressed in that sense. So uh, an influx of case management, although I know you mentioned the challenge with hiring staff, I think will be really helpful. Um, you know, I am heartened that the 
governor is in the process of wanting to um, really prioritize this in the, in the budget. I think that cities spend um, an exorbitant amount, really large, you know, mainly have often the county seat or have the, uh, the the biggest impact in their in their jurisdiction spend a significant amount of uh, time and funding uh, on this issue and we need state intervention we need state support and as the um, the arm of the state we uh, appreciate the county being being our partner in this um, I, I guess I'll just make a few comments and then I just have a quick, um, maybe one quick question is I think that one of the things we hear a lot about is the mental health and substance abuse and the, and the lack of services in those in those particular areas and wanting to see how you know our need for more services are really connected to individual success as well as how it's integrated into our uh, court system and and kind of just the overall failure along the way that doesn't necessarily lead to a lot of success uh, for for individuals. So how to have um, that prioritized or where that fits in terms of resources. Um, you know, just speaking really briefly on the comments that were made about upstream investments. You know, I think the social the issue of social mobility, affordability, the shrinking middle class. This, this larger sort of national issue. Um, how, how are we thinking about interrupting the cycle of poverty? How are we thinking about supporting youth, supporting children, um, having them with the best start in, in, in life to, to find success? Um, so those are the types of investments I too would like to see as part of the conversation. And we also know that stream investments um, really yield a, a great benefit as opposed to with the problem once it's already manifested itself. So how we kind of continue to have that as part of the conversation. I think that when I, you know, um, hear sort of this conversation around the structure and the city and the role of the county, I, I guess one question would be is how, um, how are other cities and jurisdictions integrated into this conversation? As you mentioned, this is a countywide issue. This is the national state issue, but um, this, the city of Santa Cruz isn't alone or shouldn't be alone as the one city to to really be working with the county on this issue, although I feel we have a disproportionate amount, particularly of the most visible homeless in our community. I know that that population um, kind of working with in education is different down in South County where you have double up families and a, a different level of kind of need or you know, not isolated, but but more um, prevalent in certain areas. So, um, so I guess, yeah, how are we engaging other cities and, um, and other sort of districts, if you will, in terms of uh, really holistically looking at what roles we all play in this solution? And I guess to, to that additional end is how do we engage the community in the private sector? Because we have people say to us on a regular basis, what can I do? How can I help? What does that look like? And do I don't have strategic asks for them, um, you know, volunteering, supports, et cetera, but really strategic asks of our industry, our private sector, and our community members who also want to be part of the solution. Um, I think it's a really complicated issue. I think we could probably talk about it for hours as we, as we do regularly, um, but uh, I'll go ahead and just respect all the time and, and leave it at that. Thank you, Council Member. I don't know if uh, if Randy or Robert have uh, you know maybe a little bit of a response about other jurisdictions. I you know obviously all of your materials really refer to the entirety of the county. And you know, Randy, if you want to chime in for a few, little bit here, that'd be great. I'll, I'll keep it brief. That wow, you said a lot, and there's a lot to respond to. I know you named it as one question, but there's so many things I'm engage, interested in engaging in. But I, I I want to go back to something I said at the introduction, which. Maybe in California, counties and cities appreciate the flexibility sometimes, but for this particular issue, I think it ends up being a headache. As an indirect answer to your question, in counties all over California, some counties are doing nothing, like Santa Cruz County did five plus years ago before Carlos, which is to the bane of cities' frustration. Um, and when counties step in, the office is sometimes in a planning department, sometimes it's in a health office, sometimes it's centralized in the CAO's office, sometimes it's... So that just gives you a window to say, there's no direction about how a county should even engage in this. And then we know the city dynamics. So yes, we talk regularly in regional and state coalitions. And I think, and I'll turn it over to Robert if you have any examples. I, when Robert started, I said, is there an example in California we can turn to where the relationship is great between
between the city and county, it's usually a place where there's not a big homeless issue. It is a dilemma where there's no good answers. It, there are many, many, many jurisdictions starting to do like what we're doing, creating frameworks and many, many, many trying to create roles and responsibilities documents. The fact that we can't find something that's been vetted and agreed and approved and city and county legal councils have approved, it tells you we're a work in progress. So yes, we look. I don't think we have a gold standard and let's try to become that. <laughs> But Robert, do you have any specifics? Because I know you've mentioned some other states that have some better models in California, but I, you're more plugged in if there's a good model in California than I am for this particular issue. Um, well, I think that uh, I alluded to this earlier, the community solutions group that's promoting the kind of getting to zero. One, one that I'm fond of is going to find out where people are getting results. And so, there's a county in New Jersey um, that has gotten to zero around veterans homelessness and homelessness among people with disabilities. And uh, a lot of things we're trying to do here are, are what made them successful. Um, but uh, every state is different, and Randy alluded to this in terms of um, how much state control they have of certain types of programs versus delegating to the county and the city level. California is unique in that it delegates a fair amount of health and human service responsibility to the county level, um, and other states don't necessarily take that approach. Um, New, New Jersey is one where there, there is a lot of um, support, but what they did is they created an office of health, housing, and human services to kind of bring all the resources together. They also created some clear places where people who are experiencing homelessness, the front door, back to Member Cummings, the front door was really clear. Um, and then they, uh, to your point, Council Member Watkins, they actually were, were tracking subpopulations and bringing all the different provider groups and agencies together uh, and looking at the data um, to see if they're making progress. So that formula for success is there. Randy's right that the, the ways in which people bring groups together to, to govern and think about how do we address this issue, they're all over the map from led by nonprofits to county staff to joint power authorities. Um, I did want to say that this presentation is one that we're giving to all the cities um, and asking for all of them to accept and file and join us in the framework. And all of the cities contributing to the Homeless Action Partnership um, currently. And I hope we all kind of lean in on those housing goals because each jurisdiction has some housing goals. So I think one way for each jurisdiction to show how they're contributing is let's get to the 734 units um, as quickly as possible. Each have targets. So those are some examples. Um, you, I, I did want to say a little thing about behavioral health, and we could talk more about that, but I alluded to Medi-Cal reform. I think most people are not aware that the state Medi-Cal reform is essentially proposing some significant cuts to behavioral health funding. So at the same time we're increasing funding to address the problem of homelessness, we're cutting funding in an area where those services are critical to preventing and keeping people housed. So it doesn't make sense to um, reduce investments in a critical area at a time when you're trying to elevate this issue. So I, I think we all need to, to speak to that um, in the reform effort. Um, and. Uh, I would also say on the behavioral health care front that we're living in the legacy of uh, a decision in the 70s and 80s. California was kind of a leading edge of institutions were inhumane places for people struggling with severe brain problems to be living. So we needed to help them get out into the community. But what we failed to do is to bring the resources that were in those institutions out into the community and we're still stuck we're still fighting. Um, I often give it, a, I have a graph, which I could bring another time. It shows how we approached um, deinstitutionalizing children and adults living with developmental disabilities, another neurological issue. And it shows that we gradually reduced the number of uh, young people living in institutions and increased, the, and we see far less people with developmental disabilities homeless. That's the recipe that we never followed for people with serious behavioral health issues. Um, so I think we, we have to elevate that as an important funding issue as part of this overall effort to address homelessness. So thank you for raising it and hopefully we can all 
call our state folks and really push to not cut major health care funding in the time we're trying to address homelessness. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And we, uh, yeah, we discussed that in the two by two of, I think it was uh, either the meeting before or our previous meeting. So please let us know how we can weigh in on that legislation and those efforts, because we certainly will, will, will weigh in for sure. Uh, I have Council Member Brown and then Council Member Cummings. If it's okay, I'd like to go to Vice Mayor Bruner. She hasn't spoken yet. Okay. If, if possible, I'd like to get out to the public because we are starting to get into a lot of time. Um, great conversation. Um, Council Member Brown. Thanks. Uh, so many of the questions that I had uh, have been discussed already. So thank you to my colleagues for bringing them up and thank you for your responses. I really, really appreciate as we all, um, your presentation, your efforts, you know, I think that, you know, so many of the things you've said uh, this evening really give me uh, hope that we are moving in the right direction despite the really formidable challenges and resource questions. Um, and I want to, um, uh, Mr. Ratner, I want to really thank you for, for calling out this, um, your, your thoughts on the, the magnet which you know seems to really pervade uh, the narrative and I think is really debilitating um, and you know so so for me it was just really nice to hear that come from uh, somebody who works you know so closely on these issues and has this experience from different parts of the state um, I also really want to appreciate the comments Randy that you started with and I think the tenor of this meeting about um, transparency and collaboration and you know not blame gaming I I sort of I call it externalizing risk everybody tries to externalize the risk of you know this and 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 not and externalize the responsibility and so um, kind of just bringing that to the forefront is is great to hear as well as, you know conceptually and and principle wise um, I do I so the question that I want to ask that I think is not been um, is uh, around this, this um, data informed coalition building and governance structure. I mean, yes, we have been kind of lamenting the HAP, the accountability gap with the HAP for quite some time now. You know, there's like a lot of um, questions that people have and, and it's hard to answer them uh, when constituents ask. So I, I'm really appreciative of the effort to restructure that. And um, I wanted to just ask if you could talk a little about that process. Um, in terms of who you know, who you see, who is going to be at the table? I see. I read through the board of supervisors uh, agenda packet for, back from March, and there's a kind of a timeline laid out there in the different categories and coalition structure. You're kind of set to be, you know, have developed that by next month, by June. And so I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, affecting our decision making and, and just understanding in general what's going on for the public. Uh, I'm going to say something to start and turn it over to Robert. I, I, I will defer to you as your legislative body how far to go on this because we are going to be back in front of you and Lee um, has been very involved and has all this information. So everything we're doing is in partnership with Lee. Um, I want to just invite, um, like Robert said, these narratives and other. The end result of the HAP system is what you said. It does not seem transparent, it seems unaccountable, and it seems to be a black box of Mr. Money. Now that I've been here a year and I've looked at it, and when I heard that, I was like, oh, what's going on here? I want to just add to this something I said in response to uh, Council Member Cummings' comment about lack of staff time and staff resources to actually produce what I well know <laughs> was the desire of the county I got here, they did not have the time to get the materials together to the HAP, to create minutes, to produce minutes, not to mention to put materials out to the community. So I just want to invite, there's two parts to this story. One is the governance structure, how many seats do different jurisdictions have, how are they appointed? But the other is we, which is now me and Robert, we have to resource the well enough that we can deliver on accountability, and that's staff time getting materials in place, putting them in place, having a website, putting it out there, because I want out of the middle of being a participant in a black box where the community's like, what's going on with that money? There are answers to that question, but my predecessors didn't have the time to answer those questions, not to mention get ahead of 
the understandable frustration from the community. It seems like a ton of money. The county got $5 million. Answer to that, they didn't have time to, not to mention, get it boarded and the contracts out. And there just wasn't resources to explain what we were doing. So that's a big piece of what we're working on. And then I'll let Robert share and touch about the actual decision points that are going to be in front of you soon. But I please know we're working closely with your staff. So nothing will be a surprise to you. But Robert, anything you want to add? Yeah, well, I, I think that's absolutely right, Randy, that um, bringing people together um, on such a complex issue and being transparent and clear about what's happening with resources requires human human energy and time that didn't exist before. And I feel like we are on a, a better pathway to deliver more than we have in the past. And uh, I love that you read the six months plan, so thank you. Um, we actually, uh, the way that the continuum of care has been structured here in Santa Cruz County, the Homeless Action Partnership actually has to agree to really d dissolve itself and adopt a new structure. So this week, um, Lee is a participant in the meeting. We have a new governance charter proposed for the existing board that they're going to review and uh, make comments on and maybe adopt. Um, and it does include asking the different jurisdictions to nominate people to sit on the new governing board. Um, so Randy alluded to this, we'll be coming back um, with, in partnership with your staff um, at the right time. Like we, we want the city council to nominate people to be, whether it's an elected official or someone else who expertise um, to the table to sit on that governing board. Um, I think it's gonna take us a few months to, to go through those steps of uh, our goal is to get the new charter established, and then we've got to establish the new board. Um, and I, I also want to call out that we're we're putting together some operational committees. I alluded to the housing and capital pipeline, which is a place where it'd be great to have city involvement. Um, we're looking to raise the voices of people's lived experience with um, two advisory boards, a youth advisory board that already exists, thanks to work of some of the council members here. Um, and a new advisory board for people who have lived through um, life without a home to have their voices. And then we're also looking for some key stakeholders in education, healthcare, and um, back to Council Member Watkins, business and private sector. So we actually want to have a seat on the board for someone from a foundation or a business private sector person to contribute to the issue. So if, if you have suggestions, um, please let us know. Thanks. I'll leave it there for now in the interest of time. Okay. Thank you, Councilmember Brown. Next up is Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to allow the other council members to ask their questions. Uh, and it, my questions that actually came up have been answered. Um, and I'm familiar with a lot of what you have presented just through meetings together, which have been so enlightening and informative. Um, I, I, I just want to thank you, uh, Randy Morris and Robert Ratner, for the work for the framework, the overview, the background, the mission, and really talking about the housing affordability gap, uh, the lack of supportive connections and various health issues. Um, I, I'm hopeful that was the vision of what you call the actionable person-centered, including um, equity and inclusion, data-driven, the countywide scope that this framework addresses is so key. And um, just to get to this is everything. Um, and my question originally was regarding that housing graph that you showed of the different cities and the county and, and the gaps is how, how the other cities in the county will engage in this framework. Um, and um, will you be presenting to the framework to each city in Santa Cruz County so that we can work collaboratively, not just the city of Santa Cruz uh, and the county, but all the cities with the county in the county. Um, so I believe that question was asked already and, and answered. If there was anything else you want to add to that. Um, 
We thank you for your comments, and I, I consider that a vote of hope that we're going in the right direction. It's meaningful, as the vice mayor, to hear you say that. And yes, is the short answer. We have already presented to the city of Watsonville. We present right. to Scott Valley tomorrow evening, and I forget the date, but it's early June. We're presenting to Capitola, like you, where we presented the draft in November. We presented the draft to all of our, those four city councils, so we will be back in front of all of them. And we, you know, we want to be a, as available as makes sense on a periodic basis to keep people updated. This is a complex work, and it's we're kind of in the crawl space, getting the foundation strong so we can build some more floors and porches. The crawl space still has some structural engineer problems we're working on. If you allow me the housing analogy, so it's not visible. Some of this uh, foundation work we're working on, which we hope is then something that becomes more visible as we have that infrastructure in place. So we look forward to more conversations. I appreciate it, and one of the things that I've um, found really important to continue working on, and I see Elizabeth Smith here, who's our communications person at the city, is for all of us to keep communication and information out there for us as council members, for our constituents and the community, um, and for, you know, we have a big uh, community that is engaged, and, and it's a great thing, I think. Um, it's also a lot, and, and how do we stay on top of all of that communication and education piece? So moments like this, this, more of this, I think, will be so helpful moving forward as we, you know, go through this framework as, as you are presenting to all the cities where that consistency is there and everyone understands the whole picture and all the pieces within that whole picture. So thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, I will go, I'm just going to check our, so we do have uh, folks in the audience that um, folks that were going to attend tonight. So that would like to speak. Um, Council Member Cummings, did you have additional questions or comments? I just had, I'll be brief. I just had a couple of really brief comments. One, um, to the extent possible, and this thing about is that, um, you know, there are oftentimes <clears throat> people are asking us about, you know, why don't we have more beds for certain things? And there are, you know, there are federal policies, you know, that and other types of policies that keep us from creating more beds. So the uh, Institute for Medical Disease Exclusion, for example, you know, only allows for 16 beds that could, you know, for people to receive. So I wonder too, um, you know, when some of these questions come up, it would be great if there's a, you know, potentially even a page or information that, that people can access where they can better understand the reasons why we don't have more under certain circumstances. And, um, and I know, for example, people have been discussing like, is there, you know, homeless people in the sense of when you come in contact with someone, the, you know, county being able to take down their information and share that with, you know, law enforcement or first responders. So if they come in contact with that person again, um, you know, they can say, oh, this person's in our system. We know that they um, suffer from, you know, schizophrenia or, or what have you, or that they've been connected with these people. And I think that to the extent that we can, you know, if that's possible, but if, they, if there's reasons why we can't do certain things, I think also it might be worth having information on, on what policies constrain us. And I think that also helps elected because then that allows us to put pressure on state or federal electeds to say, hey, you know, we'd really like to have more of these services or beds. And is there a way for you to advocate on behalf of us so that you can change some policies? So uh, I'll leave it there. But that's, that's just something that came up earlier throughout this discussion that might be helpful to share and, and to take into consideration. Council Member Cummings, if we get to a place where we have information that's out there that everyone understands, that harnesses the, and I think Vice Mayor Bruner was speaking to this, you have a lot of energy amongst your constituents, which is a great thing if harnessed in the right direction. But when it's not even clear to constituents or you as elected who has authority and where the rule was created that creates a problem, nobody knows where to argue. <laughs> so they seem to come to you as city council. <laughs> so yes, we have a common interest in just better educating everybody. Uh, and I'm learning too. Robert's been in the field for 20 plus years. Um, I've been in the field of human services for 30, but directly over a homeless just for this last year. 
it's complex. So yes, we want to help get information out so people know what's a federal issue, a state issue, a county. We'll own what's us and where we're falling short. So you can push on us and we'll talk about it and city. But we're not there yet. So that is a goal we share with you and we have some work to do. Thank you. All, uh, thank you all. Go ahead and take this out to the public now. Um, and I have Serge Cagno has asked for three minutes. So, Serge, go ahead, please. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, Randy and Robert, on all the work that went into this. My name is Serge Cagno from Stepping Up Santa Cruz. I support the strategic framework and appreciate that it's focused on outcomes. As we heard from our county partners, the federal government HUD is loath to invest in communities where collaboration between cities and counties is bad. I think we have to admit that we have a logical disconnect in our city's discussions of homelessness and how we are partnering with the county. I acknowledge new services we in the city are looking to offer. But as we criminalize people being homeless, if they refuse to go to available shelter, the framework sets out a plan of working to include people experiencing homelessness in the solution. We in the city need to admit that we're making the work more difficult by criminalizing and alienating those we are trying to serve. As Dr. Ratner went over in the framework, that some of the net causes are lack of connections and loss of hope and purpose. Throughout the framework, the people experiencing homelessness are part of the solution and their voice are included in workable solutions. Building a co coalition for the key objective authentically and meaningfully involve people with lived experience in system design and oversight. Increase connections had, ensure shelters are As council member Kalantari Johnson referred to, the six month work plan includes creating a countywide response to managing encampments. This was actually in the last six month work plan and it started in March. But instead of collaborating, we in the city quickly pushed through an ordinance to manage encampments without community input. We also a collaboration called for in this framework, which we say we are, we are supporting. I appreciate the framework and I ask that our city um, gets beyond the politics and the finger pointing and starts to work towards a solution with the county. Thank you. And in the interest of time, um, and Robert, um, I, you know, this was going to be an ongoing conversation. So I, I don't think usually we will, we do not respond to public comment uh, at our at our meeting. So I'm going to go ahead and hold with that tradition this evening because it, it it is getting late. And, um, so I will look to the next caller, and that is Skirt. Go ahead, please. Good evening, council members. Um, thank you, Wendy and Robert, for that great presentation. It was really informative. I appreciated it a lot. So now, knowing that 75% of homeless individuals were housed within the county prior to experiencing homelessness, does that mean that the city, that most people experiencing homelessness are actually your residents? consumers, taxpayers, and voting constituents, and not out-of-towners trying to game the system. Um, in addition, Section 8 of your Conflict of Interest Code says, no designated employee shall participate in making any governmental decision which she knows will have a reasonably foreseeable material financial effect appreciable from its effect on the public generally, on any real property, and any source of income. And just because you move, remove the map uh, doesn't make it any less obvious to me that landowners, landlords, and the downtown business association stand to gain a hefty profit if the city council effectively bans the erection of tents within the city limits. So once again, I ask Golder, Watkins, Myers, Kalantari Johnson, and Bruner to recuse themselves from further voting and discussion on the camping services and standards ordinance. Their actions have violated the city's conflict of interest code and endangered the constitutional rights of Santa Cruz residents. I ask council members Brown and Cummings to render the CSS decision void, they being the only remaining council members on this body who have no disclosed conflict of interest matter. Thank you. 
Thank you. Next up is phone number ending in 1810. Yeah, this is Garrett. Uh, I don't believe the presenter for one second that homeless people don't end up where the services are. Sure, there's other reasons why they seem to be just here in record numbers. Maybe on a county basis they did have housing at some point, but they either go to or they sure stay anyway in the cities with homeless services like Santa Cruz and somewhat like Watsonville and virtually nowhere else in the county as they lack services. Check the homeless data by city, you will see that is correct. If we want to turn Santa Cruz into a permanent cesspool of government dependence, we would put lots and lots of homeless and supportive services this city alone. It has many times more services per population than the state already, and the corresponding correlating insane excess homeless population per capita has resulted to everyone's detriment. I suggest that is madness. We are overloaded in this city by any metric with homeless individuals. The services badly need to go elsewhere. Build it and it doesn't need to be far, but out of this town. The burden of homelessness on the rest of the public gets no mention here. Why? This seems a very one-sided finger pointing to affordability as the main cause of homelessness, but it's expensive everywhere locally. There are many more reasons. There are a great many cheap places to live elsewhere also in the country. Those who would do nothing to improve their own circumstances may not really deserve much, also especially so if criminal activity... A cesspool of government dependence is not a future we should continually move toward. It runs contrary to a free people. As once dependence is established, our freedom is lost. If you enable poverty, you get more poverty. If you enable homelessness, there will be more. I'm sure the communists who seem to come out of hibernation and force when homeless issues are discussed will drone on, but that ideology is evil. Otherwise, it's a difficult issue that deserves action. I don't hear any specific actions mentioned here tonight, but since Gavin's trying to throw money around to avoid recall, be sure to get some of that. However, the data for throwing money around... Okay, thanks. Thank you. Not seeing any other hands up in the audience, so I'll go ahead and take this back to council for a motion. Um, and tonight, again, we are looking for a motion to accept and file the final version of the Housing for Healthy Santa Cruz's strategic framework for adjusting homelessness in Santa Cruz. Uh, and I do see council member uh, Cummings and then council member uh, Watkins. Yeah, I'm happy to move the uh, recommendation to accept and file the um, county's strategic housing framework report. Great. And council member Watkins? Sure, I'm happy to second that motion. Okay, so we have a motion by council member uh, Cummings, seconded by council member Watkins to accept and file the final version of the Housing for a Healthy Santa Cruz, uh, the county strategic framework for addressing homelessness. And Bonnie, could we do a roll call vote, please? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Council member um, Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. And thank you again, uh, Randy and Robert. We look forward to a productive and uh, hopefully very effective with you and the county for uh, in the near term in the three years in this plan, but obviously also long term. I think we all know um, we won't get there in three years, but we hope to make great improvement by then. And so thank you for all your work on this and for your leadership of the county to put together a, a, a roadmap for us all to follow. So really appreciate your time for expertise tonight. Um, so thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Can I have lunch? And uh, I will go back to item number one on our agenda. I do just want to uh, recognize a proclamation, a mayoral, mayoral proclamation we, uh, that I issued uh, this month, um, recognizing um, a Union American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander heritage, uh, Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Heritage Month pays tribute to the rich culture, traditions, and history of the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. And during Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Heritage Month, AANH 
of all ethnicities come together to promote cultural appreciation and to share their diverse traditions through appropriate programs, ceremonies, and activities. And although AANHPI contribute greatly to our nation, state, and city, we unfortunately continue to see heightened racist crimes and violence, AANHPI. And on April 7th, the city of Santa Cruz passed a resolution denouncing hate crimes, hateful rhetoric, and hateful acts against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in all firms. Uh, I hereby, the city of, uh, I hereby, as Donna Myers, mayor of the city of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim the month 21 as Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Heritage Month in the city of Santa Cruz in honor of AA and HPIs and their contributions that have enriched our country and our city. So, Okay, uh, so council members, thank you so much for your participation tonight and for the public for being here tonight. And we are adjourned. Thank you everyone, good night.